All right. Welcome to my session on Cloud Native Authorization Landscape. I'm Jimmy Zielinski. Um, you can find my Twitter and GitHub handles on screen. Um, however, before you check out my socials, it might make sense to understand why I'm worth listening to today. So, who am I? Uh, full disclosure, I'm the co-founder of AuthZ, which is the company behind SpiceDB. SpiceDB is an open source database that computes permissions. So while I don't necessarily have an agenda today to promote my own business, what I am doing today is helping people understand the ecosystem of authorization tooling so that if they find out um, what the right tool for the job is, they will find SpiceDB. If that's the right fit for them, maybe they'll find something else if that's the right fit for them. Either way, we get more qualified leads and the whole ecosystem gets more qualified leads and gets more education. So. With that out of the way, before I worked on authorization, I've actually uh, been in the cloud native community since the very beginning. Um, I used to work at CoreOS, uh, which got acquired by Red Hat. Um, and in that time, I've both been in software engineering and product uh, positions where I've uh, had a pretty large impact on the ecosystem. I'm currently a maintainer of the Open Container Initiative. And what that is, is the standards body for containers. Um, I, like I said earlier, I've been a community member for Kubernetes um, since, since the beginning, since before uh, the CNCF existed. Um, I was the first employee to work on Quay Container Registry, which is the first private Docker registry. Um, I'm co-author of like the operator framework and the original inspiration for a lot of the OCI artifact work. And I've also worked on a couple of their projects, um, such as Claire, which uh, does static is the first open source static analysis tool for containers as well. Um, so without further ado, let's cut to the chase. Um, there's just too many projects out there uh, in the authorization space or have direct implications on the authorization space. I pulled a new a uh, few names of projects down from uh, the cloud native landscape. This is just random projects from the security section. Um, some of these are general purpose authorization tools, uh, but it's important to note that you don't necessarily have to be a general purpose authorization tool um, to have impact on authorization generally. Uh, there's lots of tools that are very focused on solving one particular problem, and if that problem is your problem, congratulations, you found a, like, a great solution for it because it's going to have um, had a complete focus and design from the beginning to solve your problem. Uh, so a lot of these projects don't necessarily seem like they uh, might be authorization specific, but uh, they actually end up being so. Uh, for example, I just mentioned that previously I had co-authored uh, this project called Claire, and Claire is a vulnerability scanner. Um, so that might not seem like it has much to do with authorization, but actually one of the key use cases of Claire is to prevent folks from deploying containers into production that have known vulnerabilities. So um, in the abstract, that's effectively authorizing whether software can actually be deployed on a system. Um, so you can kind of see how with this broad definition of authorization and um, various data sources, uh, you can find complete uh, like uh, mixed messaging and lots of confusion in the ecosystem and lots of people sharing uh, similar marketing terminology. Um, so today, <laughs> acknowledging that the ecosystem is massive, what we're going to do is instead of enumerating every single project out there, we're going to try to establish a methodology for looking at projects like this that may be general purpose, that may be very specific, um, and try to come up with ways to determine uh, what makes sense uh, for us, whether it's worth adopting, whether it's worth learning more about, um, basically different lenses into view and slice and dice this super large ecosystem uh, so that we can kind of consume it in, in bits that make sense for us. Um, so to do so, we're gonna kind of break this down into four different steps, basically the agenda for the day. Um, First, we're going to suspend any pre-existing interpretations of vocabulary. Um, as I kind of said before, a lot of folks use similar um, phrased marketing, and that can basically make it very confusing um, 
I'm sure you've probably heard some of the terms I'm going to use earlier today. I'm also going to have a, a focus with their application in the use of like authorization specifically. So I might actually be ignoring certain aspects of these words just to um, kind of explore a greater concept in the authorization space. So with that, you kind of are going to have to let go of some of your preconceived notions for what these terms mean. And we're gonna like start from the very beginning. So then I'm gonna introduce these concepts or reintroduce them if you're already familiar. And then we're gonna explore um, how these concepts actually impact our use cases um, and how they can help us filter to identify whether something is applicable to us or not. And then I'm going to basically use that concept and um, uh, try applying it to some of the most popular projects in the ecosystem so that you can kind of see an example of how you would actually apply uh, this, this concept uh, in the real world. But no, uh, no post or presentation on authorization cannot be complete if you do not start from the beginning. Um, and remember when I said that we're going to throw out any pre-existing knowledge? Here we're going to start from the very beginning. What even is authorization? Or what even is auth? Um, so auth is actually two concepts um, typically composed together. Um, but today we're going to focus on the latter, which is authorization, rather than uh, what's typically discussed most of the time, the former, authentication. Um, most folks are probably already pretty familiar with authentication. Um, the authentication ecosystem is pretty mature. There's a lot of big companies in this space. They've been around for a while. Um, it, it's a pretty pretty well understood concept at this time, um, but actually a lot of the the things in the authorization space I find to be uh, a bit confusing at this point in time. There are um, lots of uh, different technologies, and even some of the authentication technologies bleed a little bit into the authorization space. So it helps to kind of like uh, bifurcate for now um, and establish what these terms are. Um, and that way we can kind of have a shared vocabulary when we want to talk about how these may inter, inter, uh, interconnect. So authentication primarily is about identity. It is asking the question, who are you? And then typically it also has to do with verifying that you are who you say you are. Um, this is typically seen as logging in in um, user-based systems, um, but it doesn't necessarily need to just be logging into an application. Oftentimes, this is also pre-shared keys between different so pieces of software talking to each other over a network as well. So no human even need uh, to be involved in that, for example. Um, but prim uh, primarily, it has to come down to uh, identity. Um, and on the flip side of this, there is authorization. Authorization is about what can you do? Once you have been identified and we know you are who you say you are, next we need to determine if you can perform a particular action that you're trying to perform or be in a particular place that you're trying to be. Um, so I like to use the word permissions for this because typically people are building uh, permission systems when they're in the realm of authorization. But um, similar to how uh, authentication can be both users and software, so can authorization. You can authorize particular software to access particular data uh, or not based on, um, based on varying aspects. Uh, so this is kind of the bifurcation we're going to move forward with. Um, here are some examples in the ecosystem. Um, for authentication, uh, there's a CNCF project called DEX, and DEX is an identity provider. Um, basically, identity providers uh, you might be familiar with if you're in the corporate space. These are the uh, similar to LDAP or Active Directory, and then Ping Federate and Okta are two leading companies in the authentication space. Um, these are all software that you might be using at your, your uh, existing company to log in, to get your payroll, things, things like this. Um, and then uh, on the flip side of this, there is also authorization tools. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, um, I work at a company that builds um, a database specifically for answering authorization questions. So we are purely focused on answering like, access control. Um, uh, very popular open uh, source project in the CNCF 
Uh, it's called Open Policy Agent, and this is a policy engine that's used for a lot of software infrastructure. Um, so that's trying to gate, uh, for example, what resources can be applied on your Kubernetes uh, cluster. Um, and then I included this last example, which uh, is meant to represent libraries that people use to build applications. So Pundit is a library in the Ruby ecosystem, and Flask Authorize is a library in the, the Python Flask ecosystem. And these are libraries that folks use to build in their web applications and store uh, information inside of their database, their relational database, um, that talks about the access of the users in their system or, um, or anything else that their system interacts with. Um, so these things don't ne necessarily need to be standalone projects. A lot of uh, the examples I gave are standalone projects, but actually even libraries that you build into your application and kind of ad hoc systems that you could potentially be building uh, Greenfield yourself at your own organization um, can be uh, an authorization system. So uh, just to clarify, today we are not going to talk any more about authentication. Um, we're going to try to focus purely on authorization, so the latter, so access and not identity. Um, some things can kind of get murky, so I want to make this clarification now. Um, for example, uh, OAuth2, um, which is a very popular protocol that's used in the authentication space, uh, it actually has a lot of properties in it um, that are used for authorization, and because of that, there is lots of um, there's lots of like crossover and terms that will be shared here. Um, if I do bring up any of these identity protocol protocols, I'm going to clarify that I am explicitly talking about um, the authorization characteristics of them. Um, and with that said. Now we can move on to focusing on how we're going to categorize authorization. Um, the way I like to create this is to split it down into three different categories, um, the who, the where, and the how. Uh, so without further ado, we're going to start with who, which is the question of who is being secured. So I'm currently looking at a system or a problem. And I have the question of like, what or who are the people that are being gated access wise? So there are these two buzzwords that are quite confusing. And um, as I said earlier, uh, the terminology actually comes from the identity space. Um, so you're going to have to uh, relinquish any previous knowledge you have about these terms because I'm going to use them from the perspective of just evaluating the authorization ecosystem. So IAM is a term that's used a lot, uh, a lot of the time. Um, you can see it in uh, cloud providers that offer IAM services. Um, people can refer to Active Directory or any of the authentication systems that I described earlier as IAM products. Um, it's a fairly catch-all term. But uh, the duality here is the thing I'm going to focus on. So IAM, as it exists uh, in most deployments today, is typically talking about what your employees can actually do. Um, and I stress that this is the focus uh, that you want to uh, think about uh, when looking at authorization products is typically IAM software and folks um, describing their projects as IAM software are talking about restricting your employees, people in your own organization, um, from things like accessing payroll, accessing their email, um, accessing their healthcare benefits, accessing production systems, um, ticketing systems. Uh, uh, effectively, um, software infrastructure is also included in this. Um, and then on the flip side of it, there is a newer uh, terminology, and this appears more in the authorization space and actually less in the identity space, but does exist in both, which is called CIAM, which is customer IAM. And this is largely about what your customers can do. Um, so no longer talking about your employees. If you are a bank, this means you're going to talk about um, what a person can do uh, to withdraw things from their accounts, to move money around. Um, these are the type of interactions and people you're going to be talking about, um, as opposed to uh, people within your actual organization. So the implications of having this uh, split 
is that uh, if you're focusing on your employees, um, you're not going to be hiring and firing people to the same degree at which folks are maybe registering for a very popular SaaS product. So uh, data doesn't need to necessarily be exactly consistent. If you fire someone, maybe you don't need to update the systems of record until the end of the workday, for example. Um, so there's not necessarily a tight boundary on when things need to be updated across these systems. Um, on the flip side, if you think about consistency, um, you might have to ban a user on a forum, for example, that is spamming your service or mining Bitcoin on your service. And in that scenario, you're going to want to have some form of uh, immediate uh, percolation of permission changes in your system. So that means that if you want to revoke access for someone, it should happen immediately. Um, I've used the term bounded consistency here because you might actually want uh, only certain properties to be immediately reflected, but not all properties in the whole system. So perfect consistency um, or full consistency uh, can be used in customer IAM systems, but also as a performance optimization, most of them give you um, uh, boundaries around this or the goal should be to have boundaries around this. So you can talk about the actual requirements um, that uh, your system actually has. Um, so then the, uh, there's also coarse grained versus fine grained between these two. Um, if you are talking about the employees in your business, you might be able to get by with talking about uh, the department they belong to or the team they belong to. Um, and that's probably good enough for describing whether they should have access to particular things. Um, when it comes to uh, customer systems, um, you might need to talk about access to particular rows in a database or lines in a document. It can be very, very fine grain. Um, and uh, the difference between these two um, actually has a very large effect uh, because uh, a single user could be a part of 10 million groups. Um, in a user system, and that might be just a normal user in the system, not even a special case. However, in uh, if that was the case in your business, um, that would be very strange that someone is a part of 10 million groups. Maybe they're the CEO and they just need access to everything, um, but typically this is, is not the normal case, and uh, most uh, employee-based systems of record um, have just very basic group support. These are the types of things you see in systems like um, Active Directory and the, uh, what the identity providers um, can support out of the box. Um, so uh, the final uh, impact that these customer facing versus employee facing um, concepts have is rigidity or flexibility. So in an IAM system where you're talking about your employees, um, your org structure is unlikely to change that frequently. Uh, you're, you're very likely to have some kind of hierarchy. Um, it's probably going to be easily represented in um, systems like I was describing earlier, like Active Directory, um, unless your company is going to go through reorgs or you're going to acquire another business. Um, there's unlikely to be large changes here. Um, so uh, you can kind of be more rigid about the structure and the constraints on the structure of the system in these um, in the systems uh, tracking your employees. Um, however, on the customer side, there are various domains out there. There's healthcare, there's finance, um, there's gaming, there's all kinds of different, uh, uh, basically requirements of these uh, varying domains. And in these domains, uh, they're not going to be able to tell their users or their data that they have to conform into some particular hierarchy that pre-exists and is a limitation of their system. Instead, they're going to need to build a system that can model their domain. So the difference here is that um, in the CIM systems, typically they give you kind of um, a blank canvas, but structure to paint uh, the, the painting of the world that you want to see. Um, so those are kind of the, uh, the deeper implications of kind of just thinking about the who. Um, and without uh, further ado, we will talk about some of the examples of these systems. Um, 
So let's run through some of these things that uh, are in the CNCF ecosystem that you might be familiar with. OAuth 2 proxy is a fairly common open source project that folks use to uh, secure web pages. Um, additionally, Teleport, um, which is a kind of system that does similar or VPN products like Tailscale, these are all uh, considering um, gating employees um, and have authorization systems that reflect that. Um, when we talk about CNCF projects, uh, there's the Open Policy Agent Gatekeeper or Kyverno, which these are um, systems that gate access or uh, ensure certain invariants of the resources that you're creating on Kubernetes clusters. Um, so these are all kind of fixated on kind of, um, can you do this particular thing uh, to my software infrastructure? Um, on the flip side, for customer IAM, uh, using the previous examples that I've shown before, uh, there is SpiceDB, which um, is a database, so you can actually write a schema that kind of is the painting of the picture for the system that you actually need, and then you load data into that schema um, once you have data, and then you can query that data. So that's kind of how that one lets you um, uh, deal with the flexibility aspect. Um, and then uh, we have uh, obviously library systems that are built into the different uh, uh, web framework ecosystems. Um, these let you basically write your own code and build your own abstractions. So obviously they also fall into the customer IAM, uh, fundamentally building web apps and systems like these. You're building things for customers typically. So um, that's, that's obviously going to fall um, along those lines. All right. Hopefully, with that making sense to everyone, we can move on to the next question to ask and the lens by which we will filter the ecosystem, which is where the decision is being made. Um, so this one is kind of a little interesting because uh, where has some implications on uh, generally how uh, the data you're sourcing um, impacts your system. So if you think about uh, your problem domain and you think about where the data you need to um, compute whether someone has access to something comes from, uh, that is going to be what we're going to focus on. So uh, there's two kind of splits here. There's federated and centralized. So federated is going to be the term we're going to use to describe systems where the data or computation that you're using to gate access to a particular resource is coming from various systems. Maybe you have to actually ask an API of a business that you're partnered with, um, whether a user has access to a particular thing. Um, and then that needs to be then joined with information that you have in your systems as well uh, to determine whether they have access to one of your resources. Um, so uh, th this can be either the sourcing of the data or the computation as well. Maybe you have to reach out to an external service and they will perform the computation for you and just tell you yes or no. And you'll, you will uh, basically take their, their resolution, their evaluation as truth. Um, so that's, that would be examples of federation. And then on the centralization side, there is uh, basically um, saying that the data or the computation that is going to perform to gate access uh, is going to only live exactly in one place. Um, that means that you're not going to be reaching out to various systems. You know where all the data is, um, but there is going to be work ahead of time making sure that the data you need to uh, compute these uh, access uh, requests needs to be in this place. It needs to be in whatever format. It needs to be in that place. Um, so that, that is going to take effort ahead of time knowing that, okay, uh, when data is created, it needs to be created in this location um, so that access control can happen after the fact. So uh, this has the strongest implications on consistency, as I was talking about before. Um, with federation, uh, effectively, you're going to have very loose consistency. Um, you will not have any real sense of time in these systems. A lot of the uh, 
systems that are federated kind of are uh, purely eventually consistent. Um, they're going to be making their decisions with the best data they have available to them at the time. Um, that may not be perfect. Uh, and if a system or if a user is revoked, for example, that may not be immediately uh, applied to any of these systems. It could be an arbitrary amount of time until it actually gets applied to your system or um, multiple pieces of software in your system might not even agree if the person has been removed yet. Um, and you can kind of see this uh, percolate into applications um, that are uh, using federated systems. Uh, on the flip side, the centralized uh, systems have less of this uh, problem. Um, if it is a problem for your, your domain, um, because they are strict or bounded consistency, if you have everything in one place and it's pre-prepared for you um, and you make a change to it, it's going to immediately apply to everyone that is looking at the data in the same place or computing the permission in the same place. Um, so while this has uh, uh, better consistency properties, it does come at the cost of having that data um, stored and available and in that centralized location. So uh, some examples of these are um, Open Policy Agent. So a lot of folks run Open Policy Agent as a sidecar next to an application um, running on Kubernetes, and their application will make uh, queries to the Open Policy Agent and then get responses from it. But the data that the Open Policy Agent is using to commute, uh, compute that permission is typically synchronized um, or sourced from some other location, um, often on an interval. So that means your data is only as uh, fresh as the interval which is being refreshed. Um, this can work great for uh, data that's not changing very often or uh, data that doesn't need to be uh, perfectly consistent. So there's whole class of use cases where that's totally acceptable and uh, probably for the best. Um, and uh, on the flip side of that, uh, centralized systems, once again, uh, SpiceDB falls on the right-hand side. SpiceDB is centralized, so it requires folks to uh, not only load data into the centralized place, but also to find a schema for that data to ensure all the data is laid out in, in a cohesive manner and can be queried very quickly to answer um, any of the, the questions of the permission system. Um, and then uh, also the libraries that folks are using for their uh, web applications, if they're um, building their own authorization systems, they typically store these things alongside the application data in a relational database. So uh, these, uh, this data also gets stored often in the same transaction as data being uh, written to their database, like application uh, logic that's being applied. Um, so in that sense, there is the database schema that they've created there and all the data that they're loading into their database. Um, All right, finally, we're reaching our third, uh, which if you've reached this point, it should be because you've probably already explored your problem space with some of the pre-existing tools that you've been able to like filter down to, um, and you probably know where the pain points are, because uh, this one is a little bit of a rabbit hole, because we're going to discuss how the decisions are actually being computed. Um, and what's interesting about this is that uh, it's not going to be an apples to apples comparison. What we're actually going to do is describe two completely different systems, but they are the most popular paradigms in uh, general purpose authorization systems. Uh, these paradigms might not even be used by your tool if you're looking at a very specific tool for the job. Um, but if you're looking at um, kind of taking one of these more general purpose systems and uh, using it to uh, solve the problem for your domain that necessarily hasn't had any custom code or any custom systems built for it. Um, this is kind of how you're going to uh, primarily be looking at evaluating these types of systems. So uh, there's these two paradigms. We have policy and relational based access control. Um, now, policy engines uh, are basically the idea that in order to compute a permission, um, the user should write a program and that program will be executed with some input data. And the net result of that will be a yes or no, whether uh, a user has access. Um, and then um, that, that's the general idea of a policy engine. Uh, and 
the kind of other side of this is uh, not a direct uh, comparison to that. So I'm not gonna like say that these are a direct comparison, it's completely apples to oranges, but um, other systems that folks are um, using for a general purpose, instead of uh, representing permissions as computer programs that execute, instead they uh, describe them as the existence of relationships between data. So these are kind of the more database-like systems. Um, they say that you store all of your data laid out in a particular format, and when you do that, um, they are going to try to find a path in that data between all of their relationships. And if a path exists, that means that user has access to be able to perform um, an action. So this is not to be confused with something like RBAC, which is role-based access control. Um, you can use RBAC to implement RBAC. You can use policy engines to implement RBAC. So just to reiterate, we're kind of talking about the layer deeper right now. We're talking about the implementation details for building general purpose authorization systems. Um, so uh, you might be thinking like, oh, but I only need um, RBAC, so why should I necessarily care about this, this layer? Well, um, the answer to that is actually one of uh, kind of how I was saying earlier, uh, how if you have experienced pain points already, um, you might eventually realize that um, while you're building your existing system, you actually need um, RBAC plus some other unique functionality, or you might realize that some of the default behavior in your system um, is not typical of RBAC like models, or you might need finer granularity than having just roles in your application, but like 90% of the time, maybe just having roles is fine. Um, so now you kind of have like two layers of fine grain access and general purpose access. There's a lot of different ways um, that you can kind of arrive at uh, kind of like wanting to peel back. Perhaps you've built a system and you've realized that um, it's actually really hard to iterate on and um, you're going through security uh, audits all the time, every single time you need to make changes to your application and that can be painful um, and you're not getting reuse of uh, kind of like the policies or the permissions that you want to be computed across your application suite. Um, things aren't scaling. These are all things that might force you to peel back a layer on the onion and, and kind of learn a bit more about how these tools are working. Um, so uh, what are the implications of this? I kind of just listed a whole bunch of uh, reasons or times it might be important for you to like think about this paradigm that your system is built on. Um, but I'm going to kind of focus on these two, uh, two aspects here now, which is um, policy engines are often uh, federated. Um, the decision is often pushed into the policy engine that executes, um, and the policy has to ex like, uh, exist within its own execution of the, the program, because like I said in this uh, scenario, um, policies are computer programs um, versus in uh, relational-based uh, access control models. Um, you've centralized all the data into a database, and the decision making is actually uh, merely a query to the data as it's laid out already existing in the database. Um, so that that kind of forces you into a centralized position um, fundamentally. Um, that's not to say that these all federated systems are policy engines and all centralized systems are reback. Um, that's definitely not the case, but definitely uh, these paradigms kind of influence design choices uh, of the systems that are going to lean heavily in these directions. Um, you can, uh, for example, have one global policy engine uh, executing with all of the data in that for uh, various applications all talking to that. Um, and that would be an example of a policy engine that is centralized. Um, but by and large, uh, that's, that's not the most common way you see policy engines uh, being deployed. Um, so uh, the next aspect is kind of the federation, which is kind of uh, tied in, in uh, oh, sorry, the federation of data, which is tied also to um, kind of the decision-making. Um, like I said earlier, you're not gonna have kind of uh, any kind of uh, 
I haven't personally seen any distributed policy engines where policy is executing in a whole bunch of places and then aggregated. Um, you might see data being accessed and federated out and then collected back into one central uh, execution. Um, but yeah, then on the relational side, there uh, you're almost exclusively going to be locked down into a centralized um, model by definition. You might have um, systems that are sharding underneath the covers um, and kind of scaling like a, a horizontal scaling database might. Um, but also you might see these as vertically scaling databases like your typical kind of Postgres, um, Postgres relational database systems. Um, all right, so uh, let's make this a little more concrete in the policy space. Uh, if we go back in time, maybe uh, if you've had a college course in computer science, you may play it with languages like Prolog or Datalog. Um, these are policy engines. You load facts into these systems and then you query them. Um, and uh, effectively, they're declarative. But what they do is they uh, allow you to compute um, yes or no based on inputs that you provide. Um, so by, by definition, that makes you a policy engine. Um, once again, a very popular uh, addition to the CNCF ecosystem is Open Policy Agent. Policy is in the name. Um, it uses a language called Rego, which is very much so Datalog inspired, um, and then kind of brought into the, the modern kind of cloud native ecosystem to make that more approachable for folks. Um, and then Gandalf is a system internally at Netflix that uh, is actually the inspiration of Open Policy Agent. It works in a very similar fashion. Um, I decided to include some of the internal systems at uh, large companies. So you can see that um, one solution isn't necessarily uh, tied to um, scale. Um, these things can be done at, at uh, the hyperscaler size businesses as well as um, folks just running um, one, one app on one node for a small business. Um, so on the, the relational based access control side, we have examples, once again, SpiceDB, which is actually inspired by a system at Google called Zanzibar. And so these, this is uh, basically they're taking graph database concepts and specializing it very specifically for the application of computing access control. Um, on top of uh, on top of the system at Google, which has inspired other um, proprietary systems um, at other companies. There is also uh, Facebook's implementation. Um, so if you're unfamiliar with Facebook's pro uh, initial product um, or Meta's initial product, Facebook, uh, it effectively is a social graph. It's a social network, so uh, it makes sense if all of your data is based on relationships, such as um, this person is a friend of this other person, it makes sense that access, con uh, access control for such a system is also storage of relationships between them. Um, this, if you're a friend of a person, it means you can see uh, their photos, for example. Um, so uh, you can see from that example that actually if your, your domain that you're working in um, naturally falls into a system uh, where the domain data itself kind of uh, looks similar to uh, one of the particular um, access uh, control models, it might make sense for you to adopt that uh, as well um, over a solution maybe you're more even familiar with um, or one that uh, might have uh, other trade-offs or properties that you thought were important. Um, the the ability for it to jive and just treat all of your data as uh, similar data um, is very compelling uh, for you to make a, a decision in the space. So that's a lot. Um, it, it may not be uh, things you've thought about. Maybe it is things that you've thought about. Um, but I kind of wanted to close with a couple additional thoughts. Um, there really is no silver bullet for authorization in general in this space. Um, you're going to have varying use cases, they're going to need varying uh, paradigms, they're going to have various requirements for consistency and scale and all kinds of things, and it's going to be up to you to uh, navigate the ecosystem with that knowledge that you have. Um, the terminology in the space can be super misleading. Um, I tend to try to uh, 
personally avoid using a lot of the confusing terminology. Um, kind of uh, what I said earlier uh, when I was using authentication versus authorization, I prefer to lean into terms like identity and permissions because you can't confuse them. Um, if you just call something auth, it's very vague um, and people might not fully understand what you're, you're trying to communicate. Um, there's lots of um, quote unquote authorization systems, but that doesn't necessarily tell you whether they're trying to authorize people, uh, your employees, software, access to infrastructure. Um, it really doesn't tell you anything about the domain whatsoever. And at the end of the day, you're trying to solve a problem typically. So you, the primary concern you have is your domain. Um, and finally, nothing is an apples to apples comparison. Um, the paradigms for building a system uh, building general purpose authorization systems are very, very different from each other. Um, and even um, software that you might be looking at to solve your problem can be very, very different. If there is a special purpose piece of software designed to solve your exact problem, then it's going to look very different from trying to solve that problem with a general purpose uh, paradigm or solution. Um, and because it can take advantage of lots of domain knowledge um, to optimize um, or take shortcuts or uh, sacrifice particular things that might not be um, generally applicable to other systems. So uh, you can't necessarily rule out things that don't say authorization on the, on the tin. Um, you might actually want to look at systems that are tangential uh, to the domain and not even in the security, uh, the security uh, like tag for the cloud native ecosystem. For example, SpiceDB is stored under the database um, tag for the cloud native ecosystem because it is a database technology. And um, while it is, a it is a database technology that you can use to secure um, uh, your products, um, uh, it in and of itself is not a security tool. It is a database that you use to build your own security tooling. Um, so it's a framework. So it, it may not even be immediately obvious that like you've exhausted all solutions by just simply going through um, the things in the cloud native security ecosystem. Um, so as a, as a final kind of uh, reminder, um, you should always ask questions and let your use case guide you. Um, don't jump on any bandwagon for uh, any particular concept in this space. Um, it may not be applicable to the problem domain you're trying to solve. Really think about the aspects that are going to matter to you the most and pick the solution that's going to work the best for you. So with that, thanks. Um, if you have any questions, this is my email. Um, you can find me on uh, socials as well. Um, my GitHub handle is jzelinski and my Twitter handle is Jimmy Zelinski. Um, but email is actually uh, my preferred contact form. So thank you for your time.